Thank you for joining me on this edition of Joy News Desk. Now, the Kaya Menace continues to deny many girls the opportunity of pursuing a dignified life. For the last in our series, Women on the Move, celebrating female achievement this week, we visit the northern regional capital, Tamale, to meet Najat Abdul Razak, the woman teaching former Kaya girls how to weave clothes to get them an alternative livelihood. Here's a report by Justice Beidou. Weaving and knitting, one strand at a time. Meet the girls shunning Kayaye for a new life making clothes. I'm on the outskirts of Tamale in a largely Muslim suburb. Najat Abdul Razak started this center five years ago, hoping to bring back girls who had gone into Kayaye home. I want to give the girls a skill. With those skills, when she gets married, they won't depend on their husbands. If their husbands don't give them money, they become a burden, so the men abuse them. With this, they can be self-sufficient. Many of these girls have come here as their last resort. Some escaped years of abuse doing kayae, others told by family members to get married against their will. When I went to do kayae, it was hell. Water to bath was a problem. Sometimes food to eat was a problem. You can go to the market and walk the whole day and not get anything. Most of them come from surrounding villages and have to walk up to two hours a day to come here. Rahma Fusaini is one of the girls who said no to getting married when she failed to make it into high school after GHS. Like her, many of her friends here hope what they are learning would give them a second shot at life. Were you ever told by your mother to get married? Yes, I've been told by my mother that I refuse. I came out from school without getting the fees to pay. We decided to. He began to tell me that I should look for a certain man who can take care of me and get married. But I refused. So I can get married because I, don't, I have nothing to. I don't have anything to do when I get married to that man. These are all the handiwork of girls who otherwise have been forced to bigger Ghanaian cities like Accra and Kumasi to do Kayaye, or even at home be forced into marriages against their will. But the girls I've met here are just a few of the many in Ghana today who now face the real threat of a lack of access to basic education or quality health care compared with their age mates elsewhere. Individual efforts like what has created this venture here abound in many parts of Ghana. But it will take a conscious effort from government to create better opportunities for other girls to build their lives. Justice Beidou, Joy News, Tamale. Really inspiring story from the north of the country. Now, police investigating the death of a female level 400 student at the University of Ghana have discovered prescription medication they suspect was used in the treatment of a psychological condition in her room. Now, Jenny Fanyako's lifeless body was discovered on Wednesday, and her colleagues say she appears to have jumped from the fourth floor uh, of the building she was staying in at the university has confirmed she stayed away from lectures for several days before the incident. Fresh evidence picked up by police investigating her death points to a psychological condition. Investigations are continuing and Legon District Police Commander DSP Euphoria Nochi says 
officers suspect the victim was using the prescription medication found in her room. A memorial service is ongoing for her at Equafo Hall. A 15-year-old girl also killed herself days ago at New Tafo. And yesterday, we had a suspected suicide case at a Chimota. Now, uh, let's talk to Obed Obing Adai, the senior presbyter of Christ Cosmopolitan Incorporated, on what role the church can play to help control or put a stop to the strength of escape. He joins us via Skype. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Now, let's start off with this. From the Christian perspective, what does the word of God say about suicide? That's a very interesting question. And um, to begin with, I'd like to greet all listeners and um, all viewers. And I'd like to say, God bless you all. When we talk about suicide, actually, it's a very broad topic, and the scriptures are very clean on the topic. There is the aspect of one taking his own life under duress, and there is the aspect of one deciding to take his own life probably under an influence or under a psychological failure. So we could look at it in three ways. One may decide to take his life because there is an attack on him in the spirit realm, or he has a psychological problem, or there could be a physical um, situation that is causing the person to take his life. And suicide itself um, has to be properly defined in the sense that the scripture says that no man suicides his own body. So now, it is not normal for a person to decide to take his own life. No one takes his own body. But then the scripture also tells us that unless a man takes his own life, he cannot be a believer or he cannot be a Christian. So we we'll have to understand the whole um, um, field of the situations that cause people to commit suicide. Suicide simply means people taking their own life into their own hands because they feel, um, even situational, they feel that there's no hope. If it's spiritual, they, mean they are not disciplined for anything, if it's psychological or mental, then they need, we need to look at situations or facilities that we can in to get the problem. Mm. So as a church, what we have to do is to come to it and seek the word of God and let people understand the place of God in and coming into situations and becoming victims of hope and turning situations around before, because people give up on themselves and that is how come they commit suicide. Number two, we will have to also become a place of power where the influence of the dark world on the minds of people can be broken. And number three, we will also have to become a healing center where um, um, situations of mental ill health would also, can also be touched and turned around. So these are three avenues the church could come in. First mm. of all, by the message of hope we preach in the pulpit and um, become actively motivational and inspirational by power when we break the hold of the dark world and the minds of people. And then by you, when we come to it, and then we become a beacon of hope and healing to those that, that are mentally debilitated by the situation. Mm. So, uh, um, but, um Pastor, some people, some girls we've spoken to always talk uh, about the fact that they, they contemplate suicide uh, because uh, of, of the guilt they have, you know. And for many of them, it's because they may have broken their virginity or gone against uh, some of the very high standards that uh, they're expected to, to stick to as Christians. Now, the constant word of you go to hell, for example, for fornicating, makes them feel like dirt. Is the church not demanding too much from young people? Um, um, I get your question, but the question is quite interesting. I wonder who you spoke to that gave you these reasons. Because if you are speaking to somebody who is contemplating suicide, then it was different from somebody who had committed suicide. Because if you wanted to actually interview somebody who had committed suicide, then you might have to join them in the place of death to get to know why they were contemplating suicide. Many people contemplate suicide and actually will not undertake the act. Now, um, to um, cut shadows and blame for the preaching of sin and um, the emphasis on going to hell because one fornicated or did something wrong, um, I think that the church has to grow. We 
do not have to only be a diagnostic center, would also have to become a health center, a hospital of hope to people that find themselves in any kind of situation. If one goes to fertility, the person would have to put uh, the bits and pieces together. Pastors would have to let people understand that there is life even after sin, and Jesus did not come to condemn the world. He came that the world might be saved. So on, on people contemplating suicide, we have plenty of people in the Word of God who actually one point or the other were contemplating suicide from David to Jeremiah all the way down to Paul. And um, very anointed men of God in the Bible will come to a place in their life where they became despaired even of life. So now, to interview somebody who is contemplating suicide, his answer is different from somebody who actually committed suicide. The painful thing is that if anybody committed suicide, then we here on earth will not be able to accept such a person and find out why or what led them to taking such an action. But whichever way we look at it, the church has to become a vision of hope, a place of view, a place of motivation and inspiration, where we preach the word of God. Nobody goes to hell because commit today because we sin. We don't go to hell because we sin. We go to hell because we renounce the salvation that Jesus gives. And we go to hell because we blaspheme the Holy Spirit. So nobody is on his way to hell because he's committed one sin or the other. So sin consciousness is not the way to hell. If anybody sins, what actually affects him is that it affects his placement in heaven. So sin does not stop any man from going to hell. It is reject, does not stop anybody from going to heaven. But what stops people from going to hell, from, from going to heaven, is that they rejected Jesus and blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And that truth would have to be pressed and speak to the extent that everybody hears it. So if somebody committed sin and they knew that, hey, um, with what sin I did, I still would go to heaven if um, I confess my sins and I'm forgiven and enjoy the fullness and the forgiveness of God, then I don't think that contemplating suicide would be a matter to worry about. But then understand mm. that after we commit suicide, not because they think, but because they may be under a dark influence, they may be under a psychological torture, or there could be a situation that they were not so inspired about that situation to rise beyond the tidal wave of pressure that mountain up on the other hand. All right, uh, Pastor yeah. Albea, from all that uh, you, you're talking about, there's uh, one thing that stands out for Christians, and that has to do with God's forgiveness. Uh, how can we make people who are probably suicidal uh, or contemplating suicide understand uh, that according to Christian doctrines, God forgives and so they must forgive themselves? We'll have to preach forgiveness to the extreme. We'll have to go extreme forgiveness. We'll have to let people understand that the Bible does not say that it is the judgment of God that makes us fear God. The scripture is actually emphatic that it is the forgiveness, because there's forgiveness with God, that is why we fear him. We, his love overwhelms us. We'll have to go extreme love. We'll have to preach extreme forgiveness of God, and that would give hope to people and inspire people. But when we come out there lashing people and preaching what is not the scripture, telling them that their sin is going to take them to hell, then that is where the problem is. So I believe that men of God will have to align and preach the truth of the word of God. Mm. That is what I believe we have to do. All right, uh, Pastor Bing Ade, I would ask you to hold on for a while because I spoke to a suicidologist, Dr. Joseph Osafo. Now, he had some information for the church. Let's take a listen and continue with this conversation right after. And suddenly your member doesn't come to church again. It's not participating in a prayer meeting. You need to just you know, follow up. If it's a pastor, for example, and you just see that a person looks a little bit more extreme in what he or she does, screaming, um, you don't know her to be that. I mean, you haven't seen her show such behaviors, but in prayer meeting, she's screaming left and right. She wants to even be the one to lead the prayer meeting, giving orders to everybody there. These are clear signs that something is wrong. Um, we are too quick to, you know, say that, oh, the Holy Spirit is working. Today, you know, she's not like that. She's that type who is very shy. And suddenly, this day when the Spirit came upon him, he was just giving everybody orders. That may not be normal. Something may be wrong. And there are others who may use, I mean, some metaphorical statements, like I said earlier on, of saying that I want to travel. I have missed God. I have a friend somewhere. Nobody knows. I want to just go and visit the friend. Um, I think that 
uh, where I want to go, nobody can get there. Well, I can extend invitations to you. You have all funny ways of expressing this. Um, you have to, for example, those may say, if in church, I, I wish I were in heaven. When you know theologically that life is a gift and you ha it's your sacred responsibility to live it to the fullest. As a pastor, you'd have to question why the person is saying so. Let, let us not be too excited that our members who are, let's say, about 24, 16, 17, 18, even 50, suddenly want to go to heaven the next day. And you think that, oh, they are ready, prepared, they can die at any time. Somebody can, somebody can say, oh, I'm ready for heaven, I can die. If the person keeps mentioning death, 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 especially in our churches, let us not take it lightly that, oh, the person is prepared and, and, and the rapture can come and the person can go. Some people are distressed and they feel that when they die, it's better. Mm. So, uh, Pastor Bia, that's a suicidologist, I beg your pardon, Dr. Joseph uh, Osafo, talking about some uh, signs that you could pick up with someone who may have some psychological condition or who may be contemplating suicide. And he talks about religious extremism in the church. For example, someone saying, I'm going to fast for 60 days, and someone saying they're seeing certain images, or someone using some uh, metaphors like, I, I want to visit God, I miss heaven, and uh, all those kind of things. How would you respond to that as a pastor? Please, can you come again with your question? I'm saying that um, Dr. Osafo, who is the suicidologist I spoke to, mentions uh, that some people in the church who uh, probably contemplate suicide usually have uh, these signs that uh, are extreme religious manifestations. And he talks about people who, for example, say they want to fast for 60 days or use expressions like they want to visit God or they've missed heaven. Uh, how do you respond to this for, uh, in particular with religious extremism in, in terms of manifestation? Mike, I, um, in, in answer to your question, what I would want to say is that we have to understand that um, talking to people people with suicidal tendencies is a different matter um, uh, in diagnosing why people actually commit suicide. But then, that is a springboard for us to understand um, what leads to what. Somebody may be hitting his life and would misinterpret it for the hatred of his body. The Word of God says in the book of Ecclesiastes, the chapter 7, the verse 17, that people commit suicide because of two things. They are overly wicked and then they are foolish. Now, if you become overly wicked, it simply means that you don't care what happens after you are caught. So the present thing you are facing, you rather choose to um, hit it on somebody, loved one, and then you hit it. That is not wicked. Now, to be foolish in the sense if you decide that I hate my life and you misinterpret hating your life or hating your body, then you would die and really continue. Because if you hate your life, life does not end here on earth. Life continues. There is life after death. So I believe that the foolishness of suicide or the foolishness of people or selfishness of people in committing suicide will have to iron it out. Let people understand that life does not end here on earth. Life continues. And Pastor. they would also have to make people understand the place of loving themselves and loving their loved ones. Mm. Uh, uh, Pastor Binger, I would just like you to respond directly to the issue of uh, religious extremism in terms of manifestation. And uh, he mentions that, for example, people uh, who are in the church should pay close attention to some of these things. Uh, for example, uh, someone is shouting all of a sudden. Uh, okay. Well, you, you, you get what I mean? And uh, I they, they, they suggest that they have seen certain things that others cannot see. And in, exactly. the, in, in some churches, uh, it's actually uh, a practice where people come out to say, I've seen this or I've seen that. For, for a pastor, how can the church differentiate between uh, some of these occurrences, which may be true, and others who could just be signs pointing out to a mental uh, condition with somebody or somebody who may be in a state of depression or somebody even with schizophrenia? Two things here. I believe that men of God will have to be mature, will have to mature in spiritual things and then be able to operate in the gift of the discernment of spirit. So that, if so that somebody says, well, the Bible says that let two or three charge. If somebody gives a message of a vision or a prophecy, then we'll have to understand and we'll have to judge the prophecy. 
The second dimension I believe in is that men of God should work hand in hand with health officials and counselors so that when there are medical aspects to um, people's manifestation and whatever they are saying, medical practitioners also aiding the men of God in terms of their work could also diagnose that pastor, I think that, or prophet, I think that this whole issue is not really spiritual, but it is rather mental or psychological. So we we'll have to bridge the two streams, the stream of spiritual maturity on the part of men of God, and then bringing health officials also to work, up, to work along with us, and then we would be able to keep the present trend of suicidal tendencies and visions and desires to go to heaven and to be with the Lord, and I've seen that, and I've seen that. So it demands for mature prophets or mature men of God in the public. And it demands for men of God to also allow health professionals and practitioners to work hand in hand with them. And uh, Pastor, that brings me to my next question, talking about the issue of balance. Uh, and, and because uh, the young 15-year-old girl who committed suicide days ago in New Tafo, uh, I spoke to her uncle and he says that the young girl said she had dreams where she would see either someone burying her or uh, she burying herself. And you've done a lot of work and you've written quite a lot uh, in terms of dreams and how uh, Christians must interpret it. So in this exactly. particular situation, how do you, for example, create the balance? What, what can you do uh, or what can you use as the measuring stick to determine if this is spiritual solely or it is uh, a mental condition that needs a professional psychologist or psychiatrist? The prophet the prophecy in the church would have to come up. We need the gift of prophecy and we need the gift of the discerning of spirit. That somebody is saying something, the prophet must judge. The Bible says, let one prophet die and let two or three prophets judge. So we'll have to allow the gift of prophecy to operate. The word of God says that the kingdom of God is not in word only, but it is also in power. So the power dimension of the church would have to be in place and we would have to see the free flow of the Spirit of God under the confines of proper leadership. When that is in place, I believe that the spiritual manifestations of people saying this or that would actually be kept to the lowest and barest minimum. That is what I believe that we should do as men of God. And uh, my last question before I let you go. So what can the church do? You know, I know you've spoken about a lot of things like uh, you say prophets should rise up. But the institution as a church, what can the church do, um, you know, to serve as a solution in the face of this seeming rise in suicide rates? I believe that the church should stop um, just the diagnostics and then move from the diagnostics to the um, place of healing. We are a beacon of hope. We have to become a reference point where people think of the church as a place to come to. And we should also allow for people to testify of what they actually at one point in time had contemplated and how that they came to that church or to that man of God. And actually, they were set free. And those testimonies would have to be verified by medical practitioners um, to be sure that there are no... Um, mental and uh, psychological dimensions to it. I believe that the church, in this matter of suicide and uh, suicidal tendencies, the church would have to work hand in hand with health practitioners. Mm. And, 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 and in addition, men of God should give attention to the realm of the spirit and begin to grow in the area of the prophetic and in the area of seeing into the spirit realm more accurately and then we'll become a beacon of hope to the world. Thank you very much for your time. I have been speaking uh, to Pastor Obed Obengadai. He's a senior presbyter of Christ Cosmopolitan Incorporated on the role of the church in fixing the semen suicide trend uh, that we are seeing. And basically what he's saying in conclusion is that the church must move beyond diagnostics to healing. He also says that the church must work hand in hand uh, with professionals who deal or handle uh, some of these mental illnesses. So away from that, my last baby was unfortunately transferred to the mother and baby unit. The four weeks I spent there, I can say is the awful experience I've had in my entire life. Now this is just one of the heartbreaking stories of women who go to give birth at the Confanoche Teaching 
Hospital. And uh, my colleague Seth Kwame Boatin will join me shortly in the studio for an overview of what to expect in his documentary uh, special assignment, which will air on Joy News and Joy FM on Monday. I'll bring you that right after this. Next to die. Airing Monday, 13th March at 8 p.m. on the Joy News Channel, Joy FM, and Love FM. Next to die. Well, so that's just a, a teaser for you on what to expect on Monday when uh, this special assignment is aired. And my colleague Seth Kwame Boating, who worked on it, joins me in the studio. So, Seth, first, let's talk about. How you got to know about the story? Well, I, and I had how been you told about it. the situation years ago, mm. but I didn't know it was that serious until last uh, month. I went there on a different assignment. Um, I'm coming up with another documentary. The title is Men at Risk. Um, I was doing that. Then a lady approached me and said, we are having a problem here. And I had been seeing some posts on Facebook by one doctor, Richie Salome, uh, campaigning that, that that there's an abandoned structure that must be fixed. He contacted me too, but I didn't realize how important it was. And so I went the last month and somebody approached me and said, let me take the opportunity and do it. And I had a shock of my life. Four babies dying almost every day. Uh, 91 women died last year and is the uh, lowest uh, they've recorded for the, for the fa uh, past five years. In the previous years, the figures were, were high. Higher. And it's 91. Because one, um, women, pregnant women, don't want to come to Confanoche, or they are using contraceptives, or they are fighting fire at the hospitals. That's the explanation I got from um, the, the, authorities. the authorities there. And the congestion is terrible, very terrible. You find four babies in a court, or four babies, five babies sharing incubator, and they pass on infections. Mm. Seth, so uh, the Confanoche Children's Hospital is supposed to be the biggest. In, mm. in, in the Ashanti region, and mm. the last point of referral, That's if I'm right. right, in that particular region, and even some people come from as far as the Puno and the regions. north and, no. and, and, and the upper west and the upper east. Why have they gotten to this point? What has caused this problem? You know, there is an abandoned structure, uh, General Kutua Champong, in the 1970s started. That was way back in 1974. He envisaged the problem we are experiencing now at the hospital that there will be congestion, there will be deaths, and all those things. So he started a move to build a proper facility to accommodate the numbers. Since he was overthrown, nine regimes after, nobody has attended to. So it's 43 years now. The structure has been there for the past 43 years. And I was, I was told it was fortified somewhere in the two, early 2000s. It's appalling that pregnant women would have to join Q to deliver. Because they had to Wait, they'd have to join a queue, a queue to, to deliver. deliver? Yeah, because they are uh, maternity... Not for postnatal no, or prenatal care. No, their maternity ward uh, or labor room has just two delivery beds. So in, imagine five men are in labor and they are rushed at the same time. Who do they attend to? They can only take care of two and tell the rest to join a queue. Women in need of CS are also made to join queue because they have two, they have two theaters. When I went there, one had broken down. So imagine three people are rushed in, in need of urgent CS to mm -hmm. save their lives. Again, they can take care of only one mm -hmm. and, and tell the rest, the two, to be in queue. Mm -hmm. And they die in the process. Now, now from the story you're telling, it, it simply means that these, many of these deaths are avoidable. Needless deaths, as the, do, uh, the doctors put it. Needless. Way preventable if they had that structure finished. You know? And now they need about $70 million to complete equipment handover. And as I said, it was started in the 1970s, 43 years after. We've not been able to complete Has the there facility. been any attempt, apart from the refurbishment, uh, or reinforcement you mentioned, has there been no, any attempt to finish no, this because, at all? No. Be this, uh, previous governments promised over and again, we'll fix that, we'll do this. Nothing happened. 
So that's the situ situation at the hospital. And, and it's very appalling that uh, you go through that nine month journey and you lose your baby afterwards. That's, that's pathetic, uh, Venice. And now let's, let's talk about what people will see when they tune in on Monday to, uh, to, to watch this particular documentary put together. So they're going to see all that I'm talking about, the, the congestion, the babies, five or four babies sharing incubator, the, uh, the mothers in the queue, pregnant women having to, about three pregnant women sleeping on one bed. How, how do they manage? You are in pain already, and the, la the least you want to experience in your life discomfort. is yeah, discomfort. Um, they will see things for, for themselves Monday when, when they join mm. us here, 8 p.m., join News Channel, mm. and on Joy FM. Uh, for Adum FM, and Adum, T Adum FM is 8 p.m. Adum TV and Insurai FM is 9 p.m. Okay. So uh, we've done that so, in three and all our platforms will be carried. So and it will be live at Confonochi as well. So it's across all our platforms exactly. here on the multimedia uh, platform. But let's talk about this. There's a hashtag um, uh, that is supposed to facilitate the mm. conversation mm. around this particular uh, special assignment. Mm. What's that hashtag? And what do we hope to achieve mm. With this the hashtag special. is finish this now. Mm. Finish this now. And we are calling on those in charge to make sure this is finished. Because the deaths can't continue. We can't continue losing about four babies every day. Uh, when you, you watch, you hear one of the doctors tell me that one day they had 10 babies dying. 10 babies dying. This can't continue. And we want to draw the attention of authorities, authorities to what is happening in the hospital. And the need for us urgently finish this project and maybe those who will be touched and would want to support the hospital too they can do so hmm. and and let me just say that uh, today earlier uh, today Seth Kwame Boating was on Joy FM discussing this particular uh, special assignment and so already generating co conversation yeah. I had a phone call uh, where someone is raising some other issues with the hospital but we'll talk about that later and 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 so yes the conversation has started mm. already even before uh, the, the documentary will be aired on mm. Monday how do you feel about that uh, I'm happy people are realizing they need not to be spectators now we all want to participate and fix a problem mm. um, I'm happy about that and I'm happy about the commitment of the doctors there that they opened up for us to tell this story because they are also fed up they are fed up they can't sit for this to continue for how long so I'm happy they also open up and they are ready to support us do this before you leave uh, Seth finally just uh, uh, remind us of the times, the, the, the day, mm. and the various platforms okay. that the special assignment so will be on. So on our English platforms, Joy FM, Joy News, Love FM, it's 8 p.m. Monday, 13th. There will be live screening at Confonochi. So those in Kumasi and around who want to come and see the document from there can also pass by. On Adum FM, it's also 8 p.m. On Adum TV and Inshra FM, 9 p.m. Yes. Mm. And uh, it's translated into trees. So yes. for those yes. who cannot understand uh, the English language, you have a, an opportunity to get to see this and understand what is happening at the Confanoji mm. Teaching Hospital. Thank you so much, Seth, for the work you're doing. And like you mentioned, this conversation or the conversation around this assignment will be done with the hashtag fix this now. This finish this now. I beg your pardon. Now, this is an assignment that hopes to achieve results. You're watching Joy News with me, uh, Joy News Desk with me, Benis Abubedi. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll bring you more stories. Please stay with us. <laughs>